Welcome back to 8701. In this video, we talk about nuclear binding energies. But before we get started on this topic, I would like you to have a look at this table or this diagram which shows nuclear abundances in our solar system. So how many atoms of the various types are present in our solar system? And you see this super interesting structure. Most of it is, is hydrogen here, but and then there seems to be some sort of an excess of iron um, and you know, the table goes all the way to let and beyond. There's a little bit of a gap here. So how is this possible? How did this particle get there in the first place? Uh, why is there some which are more frequent than others? You know, a very interesting question, which we will be able to answer at the end of the discussion of nuclear physics. And the first starting point is to understand why nuclei are stable in the first place. What hold, holds them together? And that's the discussion of binding energies. So we can just very simply write the binding energy uh, down. We just, you know, sum up all the ingredients, the number of protons and electrons um, times Z, um, the number of um, neutrons, A, the mass number minus Z. Um, and then we subtract from this the mass of the nuclei itself. What remains is the binding energy. Um, just for record, the mass of the proton, the mass of the proton, the mass of the neutron, you see that the neutron is slightly heavier than the proton and the neutron itself decays into the proton. A free proton does not decay. However, inside the nucleus, the proton can also decay. And then we have the mass of the electron. You see that it's a factor of almost 2000 between the mass scales of an electron and the mass of a neutron. So. For all practical purposes, we can ignore this, but if it comes to precision measurements, then the mass of the neutron, which is half an MeV, becomes well, of an electron, which is half an MeV, becomes relevant. Um, this plot here shows the average binding energy per nuclei um, as a function of the mass number. And you see that with the exception of those light elements, you see that this is fairly stable and in the range of 7.5 to 9. MeV. You also see that there seem to be a maximum around iron, um, which then leads to, you know, an advantage in gaining energy when you, or gaining energy going to lower energy state when you go in this direction and in this direction. This part is called, this part is called fission. This part is called fusion. Both processes, because we go to a more energy preferred state, are, are possible and they're you know, they, they can be used in order to assign energy from nuclear processes. This diagram here can be parameterized um, and the rest of this video will talk about a very, you know, popular parameterization of the binding energy. So this is semi-empirical. Um, it's, it's called the Weizsäcker formula because it was proposed by a German called Weizsäcker. Um, sometimes it's called the semi-empirical mass formula, and sometimes the discussion is summarized as a li liquid drop model, and you'll see why in a, in a second. What we see here is very similar to what before. We can calculate the mass, and from that the binding energy, um, by having those first elements here, and this part then here is our binding energy. And there's one, two, three, four, five terms, which we're discussing now on the next slide. What gives what this is shown here is a parameterization, um, so you can fit the data and get a best estimate um, for the individual parameters in this equation. All right, so as the name said, liquid drop model, we can think about, in some essence, about a nucle nucle nuclear light, an atom, as being built out of a, in a soup, a liquid of protons and neutrons, which are bound together. So the first term which contributes to the binding energy is the so-called volume term. Um, this dominates the binding energy and is proportional to the number, the mass number. Remember, the mass number is proportional to the third power of the radius, hence proportional to the volume of the, of the nuclei. And you know this contributes with about 16 MeV per nucleon for proton and neutron. Um, from this, we can conclude 
that the nuclear force must be very short range. Why is that? Because in order for the binding energy to depend dominantly on the volume, the individual nuclei can only see its nearest neighbor. So this corresponds to a short range force, which is roughly of the distance of two nuclei. If any given nuclei would be able to see everybody else, you would see a, a, a term quadratic in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the number of nuclei in, in the, in available. Um, as a result of this, you can calculate a central density, which is about 0.17 nucleons per um, cubic Fermi meters, um, or an average distance between protons and neutrons of 1.8 femtometers. Okay, so they are really tightly packed. The size of a proton is about a femtometer. All right. However, the protons and neutrons which are on the surface of this uh, construct, they see less nuclear, nu of, they see um, less nuclear nucleons around them. So therefore, the binding energy needs to be reduced, and it needs to be reduced with the area the area of, of, of the surface of the, of the uh, nucleus. So it needs to be proportional to R square and therefore proportional to A, the mass number to the uh, two thirds. Okay, then the protons in the nu nucleus, they are electrically charged. So they wanna get a, a part and that itself also reduces the binding energy. So this is proportional to the number of charges squared and then you normalize this by the radius. So charge square over, no, normalize, charge square over R. So this is Q square over R, Coulomb term. All right, there's two more terms, um, which are quite interesting. The first one is sensitive to the asymmetry between the number of neutrons and the number of protons. And it can be explained by the Pauli exclusion principle, which allows only two identical fermions, neutrons or two protons to occupy the same energy state. So you basically fill up the energy states. Now, as is shown in this picture here, you reach a, the lowest energy state if the number of neutrons and the number of protons is actually the same. And you have higher energies if there is an asymmetry between those two numbers. So we have yet another term which is sensitive to the asymmetry between the number of neutrons and protons um, which reduces the binding energy. And last but not least, the pairing term, which has a very similar origin. So what we are looking at here is, you know, the energy is lower if you have an even number of neutrons or protons, it's higher and we have an odd number. So you can have an odd number for the protons or the neutrons, in which case A is odd. And the worst case or the, the worst energy state is achieved having both the protons and the neutrons um, odd. So that's why this is a little bit more complicated way to write this. You have those three different cases, uh, number of protons, and number of ne neutrons even, um, A odd or both Z and N odd, in which case A is even, just to add to the confusion a little bit. All right, then you can make a drawing of the binding energy as a function of the mass. And you see again those individual terms, the volume ener energy, uh, the volume term here constant, the volume plus surface reduced, the volume plus surface column further reduced, and then all terms put together here. And you see again this binding energy parameterization, which we just discussed. We saw the actual values with a maximum, maximum around here for um, for iron 